The Delphi, Indiana double murder case has been a mystery for almost five long years. And could a new development be the missing piece we need to solve this mystery? The victims left clues behind to help catch their killer. We know when the attack starts, February 13th, 2017. We know where. Liberty German was Snapchatting pictures of her best friend Abigail Williams from the Monon High Bridge. And we know who, sort of. Some sixth sense told her to grab video of him approaching. So, we've got their killer on camera. Now she hid the phone in her pocket but let the recording roll. And now, we have his voice. And we know how it ends. Half a mile away, on Valentine's Day, their bodies lying next to each other, best friends forever. It's the middle part of this puzzle that still baffles. Why doesn't anybody in this small town recognize him? Was it a crime of opportunity or planned out? And in the years before and since, has he killed again? Here's everything we know so far. Good to see you. I'm Chris, and this is True Crime Recaps. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, you're in the right place. Every week, my wife Amy and I are recapping, developing cases, and shedding new light on old mysteries. We'd love to have you join us as we explore some crazy twists and turns in this dangerous world. And if you're tuning in on YouTube, take a second to hit subscribe and the bell so you don't miss a thing. And with that, I'm so fired up to share a new development in this case after years of silence. But first, you need a little context, so let's start with the basics. Delphi, Indiana was experiencing a heat wave on February 13th, 2017. And by that, I mean it was sunny and over 40 degrees on that Monday afternoon. A perfect day to get outside after a long winter season cooped up indoors. Plus, school was canceled. It was one of those great administrative leave days to make up for something or other. And 14-year-old Libby German and her best friend, 13-year-old Abby Williams, wanted to take advantage. They wanted to go for a walk in the park, but they needed a ride. And after some negotiation, they convinced Libby's older sister, Kelsey, to drop them off at a side entrance to the trailhead around 1.30 on her way to work. Her father, Derek, agreed to pick them up around 3-ish. And the plan was for him to call Libby when he was getting close so they could meet him in the same spot. Delphi is a small town with a big love for the outdoors. There are 10 miles of interconnected trails for hikers, hunters, and campers to explore. One of the main attractions was the historic Monon High Bridge, built in 1891. It looms 63 feet above Deer Creek, and it looks like it's straight out of Stand By Me. The railroad abandoned it in 1987, and it fell into disrepair. But that just made it all the more popular. Treacherous to cross, but doable. Some of the wooden railroad ties are missing. The rest looked like they could fall apart with a whisper. But hundreds of brave souls still ventured across it every year. Taking in the view, snapping pictures, and just reveling in the nature. It meets the main trail on the north side, and to the south you run into a red barricade that marks the edge of private property. Overgrown terrain and a steep hill go down to the banks of Deer Creek on the south. There's really only one way on and off. And with no railings and a straight-down drop into the water, it's not for the faint of heart. But Libby was fearless, and she'd been across it dozens of times, usually dragging Kelsey along with her. But Abby had never done it, so that's where the girls headed that afternoon. Was their killer already tracking them through the woods? At 2.05, Libby posted a snap of the bridge from the north side. At 2.09, she snapchatted a photo from the south looking north. Abby is crossing the bridge toward her. At this point, they were a little less than halfway to the south end. It's a 10-15 minute walk across, depending on how scared of falling you are. Minutes later, they're across the bridge on the south end, and they notice a man moving fairly quickly across the bridge toward them. And Libby gets spooked enough to record a few seconds of video while holding the phone low at her waist. He's walking with his hands in his pockets, and he's looking down because there's some areas where the track is more dangerous than others. So his face isn't clearly visible, but he's wearing baggy blue jeans, a gray hoodie, blue zip-up jacket, and some kind of hat with a short bill. He may or may not also have a scarf around his neck, covering the lower half of his face. The sheriff put his weight somewhere between 180 and 200 pounds. He's about 5'7 to 5'10. He has reddish-brown hair, not blue eyes, so we can take that to mean, well, they don't know what color they are, but 
they're not blue. And his age is anywhere from 18 to 40 something. The image is a little grainy because they were still a good distance away from him at this point. As he gets closer, she puts the phone in her pocket, but it's still recording. Now, this is the bit that was released to the public in hopes that someone would recognize his voice. <laughs> Chilling, huh? And notice how calm and authoritative he sounds? One theory is that he was posing as a police officer, possibly telling them they're trespassing and or walking across the bridge isn't allowed. Another theory is that he has a gun in his jacket pocket to force them down the steep hill. Or both. Let's hear that one more time, yes? This is the only audio that's been released to the public. Law enforcement in this case has been reluctant to share or verify most details. The rest of the recording has been held back, but they have said that at some point on their walk, Abby can be heard asking if that creepy guy is still following them or something along those lines. After they were forced down the hill, they got to the banks of Deer Creek. Now, the name is a little misleading because it's more like a shallow river. And based on helicopter footage taken by news crews the next day, it's about thigh to waist deep on an adult. But there's a spot around the bend east of the bridge where there's a sandbar so it's easier to cross. And you can't see the bridge from there. The water would have been freezing that day. And from here, the story drifts towards educated guesses based on the victim's family's interviews with media and podcasts like Scene of the Crime and HLN's Down the Hill. Were the girls chased across Deer Creek? Were they forced in at gunpoint? We don't know, but one of Libby's black Nikes was found on the bottom of the steep bank on the other side. A pair of underwear and a cigarette butt were also found in the water, according to the police scanner transcript. What, if any, connection they have to this case, we don't know. 50 to 60 feet up the steep bank, it's thick forest and rough, muddy terrain. There's one house overlooking the area, but it's not clear if the owners were home that afternoon. If they saw or heard anything, that hasn't officially been released. There's also a cemetery at the very top of the ridge and a rough deer trail leading there from the spot where they were found. It was isolated but risky, but... He didn't care. The details of their murder haven't been officially released or confirmed, but leaked texts from the volunteer search party that found them say they had knife wounds and their bodies were deliberately posed. The attack on Libby was the most brutal. and She was found without her clothes on, but she wasn't raped by the killer's body, so there's no DNA there. Now, that's not to say they weren't possibly violated in other ways. The coroner's report has been closely guarded, and we do know that whatever the police saw that day shook them to their core. Former prosecutor Robert Ives shared a little about it on the Down the Hill podcast. He said, There was a lot of crime scene evidence, and some of it is somewhat odd, but when I say that, any murder scene tends to have odd facts about it. There's a lot of unique facts there. And honestly, I'm shocked. And I promise you, the police are shocked. This crime scene was physically strange. It is very odd. He also said there were at least three signatures there. And by signatures, I mean the sick thing that a killer does to sort of sign his name to a crime, like drawing a smiley face at the scene. You know what I mean. He also says one of those signatures at this scene was, quote, religious in nature. And what exactly that means hasn't been officially explained. Possibly a crucifix was left there, or maybe it was something else. Other signatures could involve dolls or other toys on the scene. He could also be referring to the way the girls' bodies were posed. If any or all of that is accurate, then the question becomes when and how did the killer set it all up? Before or after? Now, speaking for myself and Amy, the most logical answer to the question of when is that he did it after the murders, under the cover of darkness, especially since that house is there with a good view of the area. And we'll get into the how in just a minute. Because the facts of this case have been so closely guarded, we don't know for sure exactly when the murders happened. But some eyewitnesses say they passed a man fitting his description on the main trail around 3.15 p.m. And like everything else in this case, what they saw and when they saw it has been hotly debated. 
It's worth wondering out loud how he crossed a semi-deep creek, murdered two teenagers, then strolled back through the trails without anyone noticing his wet clothes and possibly blood, depending on what their cause of death was. It's been suggested that his bulky coat could have been masking a lot of layers, so that's fresh clothes underneath. His baggy jeans might have been hiding taller boots that could have kept him dry crossing the creek. And as far as a murder weapon goes, police believe he had a gun and possibly a brown deer kit strapped around his waist. Now that's basically like a fanny pack that deer hunters use to carry their knives. And in the short video Libby got, you can see a brown material of some kind on him. But back to his escape. The nature reserve is near two main roads, either one of which could have made for an easy getaway. If his car was parked near the place where Libby and Abby were dropped off, he could have been making his way back to it, assuming the witnesses saw what they thought they did. On the other hand, the cemetery is a straight shot from the crime scene. He could have been parked there. And we're going to come back to the car thing a little later. At this point in our story, it's about 3.15, and Libby's dad is trying to get a hold of her to let her know he's there to pick them up. He's calling and texting, but she's not picking up, so he calls her grandmother, Betty. Now, he and the girl's mother had some struggles in the past, and Kelsey and Libby were raised by their grandparents, Mike and Betty. But Libby's not picking up for Betty either. If this had happened two or three weeks earlier, she could have used the Find My Phone app to locate her granddaughter. But Libby's phone was factory reset just 10 days earlier to fix some bugginess, and that app hadn't been reinstalled. So instead, she calls Mike, who goes over to the park to help Derek look for them. Without going too far down this rabbit hole, Derek speaks to a couple of people, but no one has seen the girls. And by 5.30, Mike reports Libby missing. The biggest concern right now isn't murder, it's it, that it's an accident, like maybe they've fallen and can't get up. But as the sun sets, the stress level gets higher because it's getting colder and they know the girls aren't dressed for chilly temperatures. But the police have joined the search, as well as the rest of the family and some friends. By six-ish, the police call it a night. It's dark, and they kind of think the girls just went off somewhere and haven't phoned home. They're not super worried, although their families absolutely were. It's been said that as many as a 100 people kept looking on their own until almost midnight. Now, that's a lot of people combing the woods, and you might be wondering why they weren't found that night. The Down the Hill podcast asked the lead investigator that question, too. He paused for a long time and then said, I think I'll leave that question unanswered. And in this case, saying no comment to a specific question is a comment. What do you think it means? Think on that while we keep moving forward. The next morning on Valentine's Day, a massive search was launched with hundreds of people stepping up to help, police dogs, helicopters, and other emergency services. It was about 12.15 when one volunteer group of three people found the girls, and the way they were spotted was nothing short of a miracle. The way the story goes, one male volunteer in the group was using the zoom feature on his phone's camera to see farther, faster, when he happened to notice some movement through the trees. It was two deer, but when he panned down and over, there were Abby and Libby. They'd been left on the back corner of a 40-acre plot of land owned by 70-something-year-old Ron Logan. Now, old Ron has a colorful history with the local cops. He's been slapped with a DUI a couple of times, and his license was suspended, but on the afternoon it happened, he was seen on a security cam making a trip to the local dump and drinking at a local pizza place. His errands that day gave him an alibi, but he wasn't quite out of the woods yet. Let's put a pin in that, and we're coming back to him. For now, let's stick with Abby and Libby. The easiest, closest way to the scene was from the cemetery. Their bodies were about 500 feet from the back of the lot, down a steep hill, about 50 feet or so from the water. So the cemetery is where most of the emergency vehicles were parked. Which brings us back to the how of the crime scene. Assuming we can all agree that an odd and bizarre scene requires access and time to set up, no matter how or what it actually looked like, then here is a potential explanation for how the killer created it. Let's say he left the girls at the scene and got back to a vehicle, whatever that might be, whether that's his, someone else's, some vehicle he has the use of, it's it's all on the table. And yes, I promise you we'd come back to the car thing and we will, but not quite yet. Right now, I want to talk about what happened after dark. That sounded creepy, didn't it? 
And obviously, in this case, it is. Because what if he waited until nightfall, then drove back in a vehicle loaded with props, parked in the back of the cemetery, hiked down to the crime scene, and simply decorated? He obviously wanted the girls to be found. He knew they would be found soon, and he wanted the attention. Done deal. Of course, this theory implies that he's local, or someone that knows the area well, maybe a deer hunter familiar with those trails. Delphi, Indiana is a small town. Only about 3,000 people call it home. It's the kind of place where people greet each other by name. An old-fashioned main street runs through the town, and it's only got three stoplights. But it's close to big cities, only two hours from Chicago and an hour or so from Indianapolis and only 15 minutes from Lafayette, home of Purdue University. And by the time Abby and Libby were in the eighth grade, they both played saxophone and volleyball, and Libby was also on the softball team. Ironically, she wanted to be a crime scene investigator when she grew up. Abby lived with her mother Anna, but like Libby, she was very close to her grandparents, and she loved arts and crafts. They were typical teenage girls, and like typical teenage girls, they were very active on social media. And that fact right there might be the missing puzzle piece. So keep it in mind for later. And let me just say, it looks like there might be a catfishing element running through this case. That catfish theory is based on the latest development, but before we get into that, I want to clear up some confusion about when the girls died. In their obituaries, Libby's date of death is February 13th, 2017, but Abby's says February 14th. And there's a reason for that, and it's not because Abby survived longer. As far as we know, they both died on the 13th. But in Indiana, in a case like this, the family can choose what day they want to have printed. Abby's family chose the day she was found. Libby's opted for the day she died. It's heartbreaking. On February 15th, police released a photo of the man on the bridge, or bridge guy as he's now known. At that point, they didn't tell the public it was a still shot from a video Libby took. They just said he was someone they wanted to talk to since he was there that day. On February 16th, the first home was searched. It was on the other side of the little town, about five miles from the crime scene. The details of the warrant haven't been publicly released, but police say the search was based on some tips they got. But in the end, it led nowhere. By Sunday, February 19th, they confirmed Bridge Guy was their prime suspect. They also revealed the photo came from Libby. Now, whether they actually pulled that video from her iCloud account or from her phone itself is unclear. Although it has been said that a phone was found a few feet from the crime scene, and Abby supposedly didn't have one. Or if she did, her mother didn't know about it. Thousands of tips poured in, and everyone thought the case would be solved any day. After all, they had audio, video, the girls' bodies, a bizarre crime scene. They even had DNA of some kind, but what type it was or where it came from, they refused to say. And to quote the sheriff, there's also suggestive evidence of fingerprints, but still no arrests. Two more days went by then. On February 22nd, someone called in a bomb threat to the Indiana Packers pork processing plant in Delphi. Actually, they said there were two bombs. A police showed up around one and sorted it out by four. At the time, they said it wasn't connected to the murders, and maybe it's not. But as this case unfolds, I think you'll agree that some things that weren't considered to be connected now are. So, this is worth mentioning, especially since the plant is less than three miles from the trail where the girls were taken. It employs about 2,500 people. A lot of them live in neighboring towns. And this was the company's third bomb threat in eight years, and the last one before this was in 2016. That was an employee, and they caught him. But they never figured out who called this one in. The timing alone is curious, to say the least. But it's also an interesting coincidence that the caller said there were two bombs, and a reporter tweeted a photo of the cops removing a pair of heavy black boots from the building kind of boots a man can tuck his pants into and wade out into the water and stay dry. Just an observation. Three more days later, on February 25th, police executed a second search warrant on a house in Peru, Indiana. That's only about 40 minutes from Delphi. At the time, they said it had nothing to do with Abby and Libby. But that wasn't exactly true. And keep this one in the back of your mind for later. In mid-March, police searched another home, Ron Logan's, the owner of the property where Abby and Libby were found. But if you remember, Ron was out and about that day, which was lucky for him because he had an alibi. 
Unfortunately, he was also on probation for a 2014 DUI, so he was arrested. And because of that, and the fact that he was drinking at the pizza place, the police didn't need probable cause to search his home. But they came up empty, and in the end, Ron was sentenced to house arrest and cleared in the double murder case. Four more months went by without a break. Then, in June 2017, they circulated a sketch of Bridge Guy's face based on what those witnesses on the trails remembered from that day. He had a mustache and a goatee, and he was wearing a newsboy-like cap. The FBI posted it on billboards across the country, hoping someone might recognize this monster. However, as you're about to find out, that sketch wasn't all that helpful to pin him down. It did bring in more tips, though. So many thousands of people were reaching out with information that Homeland Security had to step in and offer their equipment to manage them all. And there were a few strong potential suspects over the next two years. They were all bad guys, and they all looked a heck of a lot like the sketch of Bridge Guy's face. There was John Miller from Indiana who confessed to the 1988 murder of eight-year-old April Tinsley. Then, Daniel Nations, a man who was arrested for threatening hikers with a hatchet in Colorado. He moved there from Indiana after the murders. Or Thomas Bruce, a pastor turned rapist murderer. He pled guilty to attacking three women in broad daylight in a Catholic supply store in Missouri in 2018. There was also 46-year-old Charles Eldridge. He was arrested in Union City, Indiana for having sex with a 13-year-old. And then there's Garrett Kurtz. He was a local meth head who was found guilty for strangling Nicole Bowen to death with the help of his girlfriend and another man. Apparently, they thought she was going to turn them in for cooking meth. But here's the connection to the Delphi murders. Years ago, before this all happened, Libby's dad was arrested on drug charges and agreed to act as an informant for the police to reduce his sentence. One of the names he named was Garrett's girlfriend, who lived in Delphi at the time. And growing up, he spent a lot of time at a friend of his dad's farm. And who's the friend? None other than Ron Logan. So that's a pretty big coincidence, wouldn't you say? But... That might be all it is, and he denies having anything to do with what happened to the girls, and he may have even been in prison at the time. And then, in April 2019, the police called a public press conference. It had been more than two years with no news, no arrests, and no information. So, this was a very big deal. But what they had to say was even more shocking. They told the public to ignore the first sketch of Bridge Guy they'd been circulating nationwide for the last two years. Then they unveiled a new sketch. This was the guy, they said. And it was a completely different looking person. For one thing, he appeared to be 15 to 20 years younger than the first guy. And this person had no facial hair, no hat on, his hair looked curly, his nose was narrow, his lips were thinner, and his face was wider. It was standing room only at that press conference, and every single person was shocked. Well, maybe not everyone the investigator addressed his comment directly to the killer. Here's what he said. We believe you are hiding in plain sight, and even may be in this room. We likely have interviewed you or someone close to you. They also asked the public to contact them if they remembered seeing a vehicle parked at an abandoned CPS building between noon and 5 on February 13, 2017. And that building has since been torn down, but it was less than a mile from the cemetery near the crime scene. And to this day, no one has come forward about that car, or at least not that the public's been told. According to detectives, the killer is someone who is fairly well known in the community. But who is it? That's the question. And why wait two years to release such major new information? Well, here's where the catfishing theory starts to come in. Officially, they said they were acting on new information, and in actuality, that new sketch was the first sketch created. It was drawn just two days after the murders. Unofficially, it's been said that the description came from a friend of Libby's who remembered seeing a picture of a guy she'd been talking to online, someone closer to 19 or so. When detectives checked it out, they couldn't verify any sightings of him, so they dropped it in favor of the other man's sketch the older bridge guy. But after they got deeper into the investigation, like two years deeper, they decided they'd have more luck with the second slash first sketch. Except here's the thing, that sketch might be the fake face 
used by a catfishing sociopath, a.k.a. the killer. And maybe the police released it because they wanted to let the real guy know that they were on to him. Now, that's one theory. On the other hand, it could be a real person who was really there that day and really killed the girls. But there's a major reason why the catfishing theory might actually be true. And I hate to leave you hanging, but we have to give a quick thank you to today's sponsor. But don't go away because you have to hear how all this connects to the brand new 2021 development. And it's potentially huge. $5 here, 10 bucks there. Monthly subscriptions often feel like a great deal until you forget about them long after you've forgotten about it. So get your subscriptions under control with Truebill. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill. The fact is, companies make subscriptions hard to cancel, but Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel the subscriptions you don't want in one tap. And your Truebill concierge will even cancel those unwanted subscriptions for you, so you don't have to. Truebill can also save you money on the subscriptions you do use. They saved us $100 on our SiriusXM service. It was like pretty amazing. Truebill has over 2 million users and helped save them over 100 million. Like Jennifer B, who says, with your help, our family has saved $587 a year on unnecessary subscriptions. I really didn't understand how Truebill could help me until we decided to save for a very large home purchase. So don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash true. Go right now. Truebill.com slash true. It could save you thousands a year. Truebill.com slash true. Now, back to the show. On December 6, 2021, Indiana State Police released this statement. While investigating the murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German, detectives with the Carroll County Sheriff's Office and the Indiana State Police have uncovered an online profile named Anthony Schatz. This profile was being used from 2016 to 2017 on social media applications, including but not limited to Snapchat and Instagram. The fictitious Anthony Schatz profile used images of a known male model and portrayed himself as being extremely wealthy and owning numerous sports cars. The creator of the fictitious profile used this information while communicating with juvenile females to solicit nude images, obtain their address, and attempt to meet with them. Pictured on your screen, you'll see images of the known male model and images of the fictitious profile sent to the underage females. We have already identified the male in these images that were used by Anthony Schatz. The male in the photo is not the person of interest in the investigation. Detectives are seeking information about the person who created the Anthony Schatz profile. Investigators would like any individual who communicated, met, or attempted to meet the Anthony Schatz profile to contact law enforcement by utilizing the tip email, Abby and Libby Tip at CACOSHRF.com. Anthony Schatz is really Keegan Anthony Klein. It was his father's house they searched in Peru, Indiana, less than two weeks after the murders. Why? Because he was being investigated on child porn charges. In 2017, he was 22 years old. He'd been using a random male model's pictures to catfish underage girls on Snapchat, Instagram, and Kick for at least six months before they caught him. At first, he denied it, but then he confessed. And they would send him nude photos and X-rated videos of themselves, thinking they were flirting with this sort of Justin Bieber-looking guy. As if that wasn't bad enough, he was also using his stepsister's name as a profile name to convince these girls that they were talking to another girl. Anything he got, he saved, and he even used some kind of Dropbox system to allegedly share them. And back in 2017, they seized at least six pieces of electronics from him. Phones, tablets, laptops. One of those phones had been factory reset on February 17th, 2017, just four days after the murders. The probable cause affidavit is heavily redacted, but in hindsight, knowing there was a connection to Abby and Libby's case, it's not hard to fill in the blanks where a certain redacted case is mentioned. 
He was polygraphed about the Delphi murders, if the redactions are being interpreted correctly, then taken home. And the following week, he turned in yet another phone. And this one had Snapchat, Instagram, and some other apps coincidentally deleted on February 27th, destroying any evidence of communication with Abby and Libby, if it ever existed. He also told them he knew he was effed and he had been planning to grab a bag and get out of town. But for some reason, he changed his mind. And then, here's the kicker. Despite all the child porn they found, this guy stayed out of jail for the next three years. He was finally arrested in August 2020, and now, more than a year later, police are making a mysterious connection between him and the Delphi murders. So, the obvious question is, what the hell? No, sorry, that's not the obvious question. The real question is, Why? Why was he allowed to roam free all that time? Were the police hoping he'd lead them back to the killer? Or do they believe he is the guy and they were waiting to get more proof? And that seems, I don't know, unlikely. And to be clear, the police aren't saying he's a suspect. They are saying he's suspicious. As far as who this guy is, well, he's a pathological liar. We know that. So take this with a grain of salt. He says he's many things. Among them is lead singer for a punk band, opening act on the 2015 band's Warp Tour. He claims he was a roadie on the Warp Tour in 2017 and 18. He also claims to be a blackjack dealer, professional poker player, and co-owner of a cannabis delivery service in Vegas. So that's quite the resume. But who is he really? Or a better way to put it is, what did the police think he had to offer them in terms of the Delphi murders? The police have been notoriously tight-lipped about sharing information, so the fact that they're making a connection between the Anthony Schatz profile and Abby and Libby is potentially huge. Is this the missing piece of the puzzle that can finally solve this mystery? What do you think? Oh, weird fun fact before I say goodbye. The male model Keegan was using as his fake face online? Guess what? That guy's a police officer in Alaska now. Can you believe the irony? And that's your recap. Thanks for spending some time with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, please subscribe, give this a like, and hit the bell so you never miss a story. And thanks again for spending your time with me today. Amy and I are here with new recaps every week. So until next time, take care.